What if I were to tell you that the separation of church and state was, in its origins, not an atheist's proposal, but a value deeply rooted in Christianity? What if I told you that theocracy ironically helped to create modern state secularism? Or that secularism was formally established in the West by the same country which today undermines it most? Well, as you might have guessed, I'm about to do just that, as I give you a brief history of secularism. The term secularism was coined by George Jacob Holyoke, who also, by the way, coined the term jingoism. He was a non-religious writer who at different times labeled himself an atheist and an agnostic. His conception of secularism is the broad definition, namely anything of this world, not involving religion. As he puts it, secularism is a form of opinion which concerns itself only with questions the issues of which can be tested by the experiences of this life. A more familiar understanding of secularism might be state secularism, which is the idea that government should be secular, or as it is most commonly expressed, the separation of church and state. That particular form of secularism does not find its root in modern atheistic writing. In fact, perhaps the first person to ever advocate a separation of church and state was this guy. Okay, you might be more familiar with him when he looks like this. That's not really what he looked like, but that's fine. According to a book called The Bible, a man named Jesus said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. A narrow reading of this narrative is that Jesus is telling his fellow Jews to pay their taxes to Rome because Tiberius' face is on the money. More broadly, he's making a distinction between the secular world and the world of God. He's pointing out that worldly matters can and perhaps ought to be separated from religious matters. This idea has not been lost on the great Christian theologists. Thomas Aquinas, for example, distinguished between a good man and a good citizen. And numerous Christian writers, such as Martin Luther, referenced two kingdoms, God's kingdom and the kingdom of the world. That isn't to say that Christianity has always had a clear separation between the secular and the religious. Indeed, Romans 13 makes it quite clear that the reason secular authorities should be obeyed is that they are put there by God. Throughout the Middle Ages, kings and queens claimed their birthright of state power based on God's appointment and sought the approval of religious figures, like the Pope, to legitimize their authority. And after freeing himself from papal authority, King Henry VIII appointed himself to be the supreme head of the Church of England, essentially making England a theocracy, the extreme opposite of a secular society. As a result of English theocracy, waves of religious minorities from England would eventually pour into the New World. Puritans, Quakers, Congregationalists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, Catholics, and Jews would all find homes in the 13 colonies of New England. This religious diversity made secular government a practical necessity. After the Revolution, the Founders enshrined many of America's core values in the First Amendment of the Constitution. The first two clauses protected state secularism. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Many of the founders were, of course, practically godless deists. They very often derived their approval of the separation of church and state from Enlightenment thinkers such as John Locke. But the impulse to keep religion away from government was not the exclusive concern of non-believers. In fact, it was the Danbury Baptist Association of Danbury, Connecticut, who prompted Thomas Jefferson to coin the phrase Wall of Separation. They had sent a newly elected President Jefferson a letter voicing their concerns that the Congregationalists of Danbury might trample on their minority rights of religion. Jefferson assured them that the Constitution's two clauses on the matter protected their natural right to worship freely. A less popular confirmation of America's stance on the separation of church and state can be found in the Treaty of Tripoli from 1797, which states that the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. It would be a long wait for the rest of the world to embrace secularism. The French variant, called laïcité, would not be formalized until 1905. And the first predominantly Muslim state to embrace the concept of secularism was Turkey in 1928, thanks to the reforms of Ataturk. The Soviet Union would embrace government without religion, but in many instances overstepped the mark and embraced policies to erode religion and religiosity, particularly amongst the Russian peasantry, who the Muscovite elites regarded as backward. In a misguided direct response to the atheism of the Soviets, Americans began to distinguish themselves as godly, and thus began the erosion of secularism in America. Unless we understand 
and work effectively for the principles upon which our American way of life is founded. Stand away from the stand. For Americanism for many years, and I shall stand away from the stand. Fight for the Bill of Rights, which I'll stand to take this man away from the stand. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this guy's just some right-wing paranoid reactionary who had a horrible upbringing and whose father beat him every day with a Bible. Well, maybe that's true, but it never did me any harm. The National Prayer Breakfast was established in 1953. The words under God were officially added to the Pledge of Allegiance the following year. In 1956, Congress passed an act to officially adopt In God We Trust as the nation's motto, replacing the unofficial motto that had been widely used since the founding. The inclusive, hopeful, pluralistic phrase, e pluribus unum, meaning from many, one. These formal symbolic changes mark more significant cultural attitude changes and potential policy decisions. In 2014, a Pew Research survey found that 53% of Americans would be less likely to vote for a presidential candidate who was an atheist. Meanwhile, back in the UK, a 2015 survey of 225 parliamentary candidates found that a full third openly admitted to being atheists. When the religious Christian Prime Minister Tony Blair was asked to state his views on the divine, his top spokesman interrupted saying, we don't do God. Ironically, while today most Western democracies don't do God, in America the profession of Christian belief has become an informal test for nearly every public office. And faith can change lives. I know because it changed mine. When I wake in the morning, I wait on the Lord. And I ask him to give me the strength to do right by our country and its people. I brought my Bible. Okay? 